Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas V. Miras. This podcast is an offering to the Holy Family and, less importantly, a production of CatholicCulture.org. Hey everybody, I'm so happy to be able to give you this episode. It's a conversation with a very dear friend of mine, the composer and pianist Mark Christopher Brandt. I had him on before in episode 33, and to me that was the best episode of the show up till this point, so I'm really happy to have him back on. It was a really joyful and uplifting conversation, which I think will be a great way to start off Lent. And one very cool thing about this is that we're talking about his latest album, on which I actually played piano. The album is called The Butterfly, and it consists of a five-part suite for string quartet and piano, featuring the Manassas String Quartet, which is made up of Emil Chetanov on first violin, Christopher Dixon on second violin, Jennifer Boxtage on viola, and Catherine Colburn on cello, and then two solo piano pieces. And you'll be hearing the whole suite in this episode. And by the way, it just happens that one of the two solo piano pieces I mentioned is the theme music for one of our other podcasts, Catholic Culture Audiobooks, which you may have heard. So the Butterfly Suite uses the transformation of a butterfly as a spiritual allegory for conversion, and it's got a little text accompanying it, which I will read to you, and then I'll play you the whole suite front to back, and then you'll hear Mark and I talk about it. So here's the text. Dawn breaks. The first streaks of orange-yellow light split through the trees and shimmer across the surface of the dew-covered meadow. There the butterfly is at work, painstakingly trying to wrench himself free from his cocoon. What was at first a necessary means to his growth has now become an obstacle to his freedom. He pushes, turns, pulls, relaxes, and then begins again. Each new attempt at freedom brings with it a renewed zeal and intensity as the butterfly strives to be released from the skin of his former self. Finally, in one paradoxical moment of both attainment and surrender, he breaks forth like the dawn and emerges as a new creation. Does the butterfly see through different eyes and view himself to be completely new in shape and form inside and out? Maybe not at first. However, we see the results of the transformation as he flies by, and all too often we forget what he used to be. That becomes irrelevant to us, and so we are no longer inspired to face our own cocoons. Instead, we look upon those who are no longer bound by theirs as the chosen few. Okay, so now I'm going to play you the whole suite from front to back. It's about 15 minutes. Again, it's five parts, and the parts are titled The Cocoon, The Rhythm of Involvement and Detachment, The Dark Night, Surrender, and the final movement is The Butterfly. And then you'll hear Mark and I have a conversation about the album. Thank you. 
Mark, welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thank you, Tom. It's nice to be back. So the listeners have just heard the uh, Butterfly Suite from your latest album by the same title. And first of all, I'm, I'm happy to have this opportunity to thank you publicly for the great privilege of playing piano on the album. Not only was, you know, being able to play and record the music a privilege, but also the experience of being guided through the process by you because this was my first really serious recording project that I've been involved with. So I, I really couldn't have done it without your guidance in how to practice, how to prepare more generally, and then your guidance in the studio. So thank you very much for that. Oh, yeah, it was a pleasure. So an interesting point for people who don't have the album and so they can't see the liner notes, but if they had them in front of them, they would see that you played piano on parts of the last movement of the suite. And of course, anybody who heard our previous episode, I think that was episode 33, which featured you much more as a pianist, would know that you're an accomplished pianist. So they might wonder, what made you decide to have another pianist record this music rather than just doing it yourself? Well, yeah, it falls in the category of being a composer and wanting the objectivity of hearing everything outside of myself and not being the participant. You know, many cases, usually the composer is also a musician in the project, or a lot of times, as in the case of a pianist. So you compose music for yourself to play on. But I wanted to actually hear everything I had composed and hear it as I hear it, I'm hearing it inside me anyway. So you record these things to document them for people to listen to what you're actually hearing all the time inside you. So in this case, I actually wanted to hear the entire thing objectively outside of myself on a, the medium of recording and not you know, be involved in the playing of it. So it was just really for objectivity and for spiritual reasons, to get a deeper understanding of the creative process. So I would like to just take a moment to talk about the other musicians on the album because they were such a great, a great example of people serving the music and being there to serve, serve the music and the, the vision of the composer while still being creative and just being so professional and having a positive attitude. I mean, I'm, I'm really inspired by the, the way they approached the whole project and the recording process. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am too. You know, it was very inspiring to be with them and to watch how they did things. I gave them a lot of freedom and that at first was very surprising to them. And they continually had these, well, first of all, these are all, extremely gifted and professional musicians in the classical world. They play with professional symphonies. They play as a functioning string quartet for many different functions, and they all freelance individually for very 
prestigious situations and really great musical situations, and always in the classical realm. So when you do that, you show up, if you're violinist or cellist or whatever, you show up for the performance and or the rehearsal, and you're handed the music, and you're handed the everything is dictated to you, how you're going to bow the instrument, how you're going to feel it, crescendo, diminuendo, all of the, the things that go with dynamics most of the time. And then there's possibly even a conductor, even if these are new works, not necessarily traditional works that have been in existence. Either way, the approach in that world of music is that everything is you know, dictated to the musicians and including the notes, of course, that are written. So their expertise and their virtuosity is what's required to be able to deliver what has been handed to them. But their personality is not always required. Their individuality is not always required. It's really their skill. And they live in that world constantly where there is a detachment from themselves because they really don't have an opinion that it isn't that it's not respected, it's that it is not relevant many times because mm. they're there to do a job. And the job is that of the person who's hired them. So that was intentional on my part to give them much more freedom with regard to all of the dynamics, all the aspects of intonation, interpretation, personality, breathing, Everything that goes with the music that's not just simply the written notes and the rhythm. Attack, sometimes even how long they would hold notes, the decay, all of these things I gave to them. And in the beginning, they were a little bit uncomfortable because it seemed like there was too much freedom, which was also you know, really beautiful to watch as they started to realize that I, I meant it. I actually wanted them to decide so they would talk amongst each other how to phrase, how are we going to bow this? Well, what if we try this? And I'll just add that the thing that's the most amazing to me about the string players, and I learned this first from Catherine watching her when she played on the Nightingale, was that they can play things, the exact same notes, three or four, maybe even more ways. And every single time, it's different, feels different, sounds different, has a different bite or a different attack different timbre. It's incredible. And it's the same exact line. And that's absolutely fascinating to me. And in the jazz world, you know, the goal is you would never play the same line twice. You would want mm -hmm. to be improvising. But these guys don't improvise in that sense, but they can play a line over and over again and do it differently every time. And then you're supposed to tell them which one you like and which one you want on your album or in the performance. And I almost every time I said, I, I don't want to make that decision because every one of those is spectacular. And that's how great yeah. these musicians are. They're just, every one of their interpretations was fabulous. So I didn't want to decide. I wanted them to decide which one they liked and preferred. And so that really answers your question the long way that they ended up dictating or determining more to the point, determining how this thing would feel. And that made me very happy because I was only involved in presenting them the notes, but mm. the delivery and the energy and the feel is actually 100% from these four beautiful musicians. Yeah. And, you know, I had the, the wonderful experience of, you know, you stress something similar in sort of telling me how to practice and how to prepare, which was play things be able to play the phrases a number of different ways. So then you'll have the freedom to make a lot of different choices in the studio. And that was actually going through that process and seeing the results, both in the pieces with the strings and in the two solo piano pieces, which people can hear if they get the album, was really something... I'm still chewing on that. I'm still... <laughs> you know, I, I'm still kind of amazed because I'm sure it wasn't surprising to you who've been through the process so many times. But to me, you know, I, I was surprised by how certain things came out that I didn't think 
you know, I had down as much as it turned out that I did, for example, in the studio. And then there were things that I thought I had down that, that I made some mistakes on and had to do other takes. And that was another great thing that really made an impression on me in the first session we did with the strings, because you impressed on me that, you know, you don't have to be ashamed. It's, it's not a sin, so to speak, to make a mistake. You want to prepare so that you're not wasting studio time and that you can deliver artistically. But the occasional mistake is almost inevitable. And once you're in it, if you've prepared properly, you don't have to apologize for having made a mistake. You can do another take and be cool about it. And there's a freedom in that, in both the intensive preparation and the being chill if a mistake happens in the studio. Mm. So that's something that I'm really thankful that you told me that because I think you saw me getting a little stressed out and upset with myself after having made a couple of mistakes in the recording mm. process. And you you said, you know, came over to me and said quietly and, you know, very gently, like, don't apologize. You know, it's it's fine. So that was something that that really stuck with me. Yeah. Well, when you practice things as many years as these musicians do, these string players I'm, that are played with me, and also myself, I, I've spent you know, years practicing every day. There's a few days in my life I haven't practiced at something and trying to master something. And when you spend that much time at something, you inevitably are making mistakes in the process of what you're going for and then in the delivery of what you've tried to accomplish. So it's inevitable, you know, 365 days a year, if you practice every day for four or five hours, even eight hours, if in fact that's how much you practice, the odds of making a mistake in any one of those days or weeks is just astronomical. Mm -hmm. it's, it's off the charts. And it's more than possibly playing everything perfect every single day for a week in a row. So that would be a good analogy number-wise. And that's the point, is that when you do it that much, you learn to realize that the mistakes are not something that you get hung up over. They're just naturally, they're, they'll happen, and you move away from them quickly, or they become a stigma that doesn't have to be there. And you start obsessing over the fact that you made a mistake. It usually has to do more with lack of preparation and or lack of experience in that realm. In your case, I saw it as lack of experience because you were totally prepared. So there was no mm. need for you to apologize for making a mistake because you were in that world with all of these musicians that, like you said, it's inevitable and you just move on. It's the thing I tell all my Catholic students that I ask them, what's the difference in a mistake and a sin? And, and they almost all of them answer a sin is something you do intentionally or knowingly that's bad and you shouldn't do it and you analyze the choice or you look at the choice or you fall to the choice but it's something that you know you're involved in and you shouldn't do or you should be sorry after you've done it but a mistake is something that can happen to anyone it's completely arbitrary involuntary it's no one, in other words, nobody makes a mistake on purpose mm -hmm. for, for any reason at all, unless they're actually making a mistake on purpose to mess somebody up and, mm. that, and act like it's a mistake, in which case that's a sin. Right. So that clarity is the freedom that mistakes are just absolutely nothing to be afraid of or worry about. And if more children were taught that, then the world would be a different place. There's a black and white teaching there that's very easy to confirm and live with on a daily basis with small children, and it becomes the way of life when you're older. You know, you, you don't, you know, you just don't need to be hung up about the mistakes. If you drop something and make a mess, you clean it up. You don't walk away. So even there, it's not essential as that you apologize, as that you get engaged and clean up the mess you made so as not to inconvenience someone. Right, you take but responsibility. It, yeah, of course. And it's easier to take responsibility for either when you have a clear teaching at a young age of, of both. So anyway, that's really why I approached you, was to bring you up to the level 
where you already were musically, but everybody else is living in, you know, mistakes happen and, okay, I'd like to go and do that again. I can play that better. That's what I've always heard from all the musicians I've worked with. And that's what I say. Hey, I got to do that again. I need to do that again. There's a mistake. Hey, I didn't hear a mistake. Oh, it's right here. Everybody's happy to point them out. I'm happy to point mine out so we can get the best out of ourselves and give the best to the listener. Right, right. Well, it was, you know, it's a precious lesson. And also, you know, having this, not just as an experience in my life, but as a recording, as a document, that, that's a precious thing to be able to go back to as I keep working at, you know, surrendering to my vocation as an artist, because I can see the results. It's really clear and objective. And I have that as kind of a touchstone to go forward. So that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm grateful for the experience, not just because of that specific music, of course, which is wonderful and a great thing to work on, but also just the experience of going through the process mm-hmm. and seeing the results. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad because that really is one of the things that the pop culture and the modern culture is losing because everybody can do these things at home with their own basic toys not to demean the technology, but the fact that all of this electronics is so available and you can push a couple of buttons, get a couple of sounds, a couple of things happening. Then you sing a little thing here, a little thing there, throw harmony on it, and then you can put it up on YouTube or Facebook and Instagram, whatever, and everybody likes it and loves it and says you're amazing. And you never really understand the process of what a real artist goes through like mm. you just described. And having something documented is an incredible part of being an artist. It's not simply, hey, look at me, I did an album. It's documentation of you as a person in the time continuum of artists. And it's absolutely essential if you're a real artist to have some form of documentation. And same as if you were a sculptor, you would want to have something sculpted that you did that you could point to and say, here's the proof that I'm a sculptor. There it is. This is my work. So that's the unfortunate reality of what we're dealing with, with young people. They don't even unfortunately see a need for piano lessons often because they can do so much of what I'm trying to share with them now on their own with a couple of buttons and a tiny keyboard. They don't even need the 88 keys so mm-hmm. they don't they don't need that process you described so you're right it's an incredible you know gift to have it documented and that is the goal of the artist is to have documentation and then a reference as to what what's next you know right. what I, and it, where's my legacy and where am i going and this goes back to actually something you were talking about in our previous interview because you were talking about how you, when you were recording your totally improvised solo piano albums you know the way that it changed you is you would look back the next day after recording it or after it was released and and say, well, if I can do that, then I need to be doing so much more. And you were talking in a spiritual context there, but of course, mm-hmm. also in a musical context. Mm-hmm. And it's very interesting how something that we've already accomplished or God has accomplished through us can we've already done it. And yet it can serve as a challenge for the future. Yeah, I yeah. Well, that was pretty much a definitive statement there. <laughs> don't need <laughs> don't need to expound on that. That yeah, that's exactly what it's about is and that's again why you document it because it also helps you stop the process and move to the next place. If right. all you do is ever practice and work and you don't have objectivity, you can love what you're doing and, and everything's great, but if you don't have some kind of reference that you've accomplished goals right. in your life, then you don't really know when you're ready to go to the next level or if you even need to. But when you document something you actually were attempting and you can objectively listen to it, then you know, is your next project going to be in this realm of difficulty or are you going to move to a new level of challenge And is the challenge physical or is it more sound based, like more harmony based, more melodic, more improvisational? All of those things, you know, come from the process of practicing. And it's why a lot of people do recitals when they're kids. Mm -hmm. So they they can move to the next 
you know, the next place. They used to say that you're only as good as your last performance. <laughs> so whatever your last performance was, that's how good you are. And now you need to go forward from there, you know. And so there's some truth to that. But it's just like, you know, prayer or living the Christian life. You know, if all you do is ever pray, you pray your prayers and you are with your family, but you never encounter other humans, you never go out and drive in traffic, then you're never going to get challenged. So you don't mm. know if you're growing closer to Christ or just getting better at following the rules. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, once you have an encounter with a person and they challenge your beliefs or they challenge your behavior, then you suddenly realize, okay, am I leaning on Jesus in this moment or am I leaning on Mark in this moment? And then you know, okay, I can pray more, but it's really more about the surrender in the moment to Christ. And more prayers may not be the answer, but more actual application of what you're asking for in prayer is what's needed. Right. So with the value of the rosary is, of course, where I'm looking at always, because in the end, you're not asking for things for yourself necessarily. You're asking for virtues for yourself. You're trying to become virtuous, not acquire houses and cars and property. You know, that's the idea. Or you're trying to be charitable and kind to people. That's why we pray. We don't pray for... The reason of prayer is not for cars and money and all of that. That's something you can ask for, and it helps you grow in trust. But the point of prayer is communion with God and to know Him better and grow with Him. And the more you do that, the more you realize that He's going to give you the house and the money and the cars and all the things you really want just because you're actually following Him and trying to be with Him. Right. So, yeah. kind of got off on a tangent there, but I felt like no, I finished it. That's great. I mean, it, it's kind of like, I guess it's basically like why, you know, if you're not living the graces given to you in prayer, then what good is adding, you know, a, another hour of prayer yes, right. to your day going to do? Right. Yeah. And it's um, the same thing with practice. If you practice all the time and practice, 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 and you're getting good and you're really getting good, but you never go into the studio and know the pressure of having to do it right and having to fix your mistakes and face them, having to interact with other people who might make a mistake while you were playing perfect, and now you have to go and do it again because they failed, and that teaches you patience and love for their humanity. These are mm -hmm. all spiritual lessons that are acquired by being in the mix with musicians at this higher level. Yeah. And, you know, and so then you realize you, when you're impatient with somebody because they made a mistake, you don't need to go practice the piano more. You need to be more gentle and respectful of other people's process as you would like them to be with you. So that becomes spirituality, not musicality. So to turn to the timeline of this album, you know, if somebody, again, if somebody were look, looking at the liner notes, they would see there's the suite, which is originally composed in, is 1999, correct? Yes. And then there's these two bonus tracks, these solo piano pieces, which you wrote as a student in the early 80s, as a composition student. And then the album is released towards the end of 2019. So that in itself is very interesting. And one aspect of it is is continuous with your other projects. A lot of them are very long. You're always playing the long game. I mean, the round trip album, of course, is another great example of that. But... Also, the fact that it, it covers so much of your life journey and your journey as a composer. And I love that it's the Butterfly album that you put those early pieces on because it fits with the spiritual theme of the journey from the cocoon to the butterfly. So you've got these pieces that you wrote as composition exercises. And then on the suite, you've got a fully identifiable style of your own. And then, of course, you've kept working at that in the intervening years up to the point when this thing finally got recorded. And so it's all really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> I love being an artist and I, I've loved embracing it and celebrating who I am and what I am. That's part of the massive aspect of conversion is accepting, you know, that totally and completely as anybody else you would hope would do that in their vocation and their walk in life. You can't you're second guessing who and what you are. 
then you don't really enjoy it or, or do it as well as you could. So yeah, the long game, I like that. But I do think in terms of you know my life in relation to the music and the art, not how I can fit in with the current trends, but right. how I, what I hear in the present moment. Because this is the present moment right now in 2020 is exactly what's occurring. And so that's where I want to be. But also thinking in terms of hindsight, that's where the butterfly came from. It was already written. It wasn't something I had to compose, but it was something I never really documented like I wanted to. I did a little bit here and a little there and just experimenting with it. And I never had the piano pieces from that early time documented. And so I felt like, I really felt like I could put a large part of my composing in order and my performance in order by doing this pivotal piece of work that occurred right at the end of the millennium. And there was a lot going on in my life at that time, and I, I was composing lots of different things, and this is the one that didn't really find a home. I will say uh, in high school, I was into jazz. I was immediately enthralled with music and jazz, very young age. But by my junior year, I started hearing string works and unique things by string players. And I had a real desire to work my entire life, if it took me that, to get to where I could write for strings. And not so that I would be respected, but that the string musicians would like it because that in itself is you know the imprimatur if these great musicians like what you've composed and are enjoying it then mm. you've created a beautiful work of art to share with people because the people involved in playing it are loving it and because they don't always love what they play they do it for money and they do it because they're good at it and that's why they are good and that's why they try to be good is so they can make a living at it but in my case they all loved the music, and that was always my goal and remains that, is I want to write music that's beautiful, and what I'm hearing in my heart, not what I think will impress people or get sales or build me a fan base. None of that's on my radar or my integrity meter. It's always about what I hear and what I want to share with people is who I am as an artist and who God made me to be and who, you know, who he's forming me to be. So I really worked to stay true to that. And having said that, this album was not documented. And I felt like I finally knew string musicians who I could enjoy working with and totally trusted to take a lot of control in the delivery. And so this was a perfect time in my life to get that done and actually move forward into more string works, which is something I'm completely involved in in planning. Oh, wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about your idea of the continuum? This is a word that I've heard you use a lot, and it's something like the tradition. Is it, is it synonymous with the tradition, or is there a slightly different emphasis there? Yeah, I don't know about the tradition aspect of it. I, think, I know that's in it. But when I was at Berkeley in Boston studying, that's the word my teacher used. Mm. And he was discussing that you learn and you are in a continuum. In other words, he used Charlie Parker. And I, I was fascinated by the fact that Charlie Parker passed away. And then John Coltrane, you know, appeared on the scene, or basically took the mantle and continued the saxophone from there. Charlie Parker was playing alto. He started playing tenor at the end of his life. Mm. And a lot of people don't know that. And then John Coltrane comes along and starts out being a tenor player and kind of became the next real person to listen to and study with and took, you know, these some of these things to the next level as far as musicianship. And so that was the word that my teacher used to describe it. Is It's a continuum. And he was saying, you're part of the continuum. And so you're not going to have a great career trying to do what was done in the 40s, you're going to need that to understand what came before you. But you're going to do better being in the continuum if you be who you are at your time and process everything and then deliver it with your view. And that's mm. the, the next part of the timeline. 
And it was beautiful because it doesn't require you to be famous. In a very real way, it, it requires you to be genuine and honest in your study, in your development, and then in your integrity. Your offering has to be completely you and completely based on your experiences and your view of all things. And that was very helpful to me because it formed me to work hard at me. And that's, of course, a precursor to being a Catholic and a Christian, following Jesus specifically, because it's not just a religious thing. It's a spiritual way. And you cannot deny yourself if you don't know who you are. So it's, it goes the same with music. If you don't really know who you want to be, you can't offer music that you can live with and sleep with and die over and say, yep, I like it. And if you don't like it, it's okay. But I like it. And that's why I've produced it. You have to be able to have that kind of commitment to the music and to the continuum and to yourself. That's so I, I don't know if I answered your question well, but no, that's good. Trying to think it through as it comes because it's you're just part of the time loop. And I guess that's the point really I missed is I meant to finish with was it isn't about being famous. It's about being great at what you do and never giving up that attempt or that daily attempt at being greater and doing something better than you did yesterday and always trying to offer it for the fa the simple fact that you can. That's it, because God made you to do this, so that's why you do it. There's no other reason to do it. And there are, you know, how many souls in heaven, they're all hearing it, and we're all going to be with them one day. And they all have to be factored in as listeners. Mm, wow. Because, you know, one day I could meet the Lord in my judgment with my accounting, and he's going to ask me like the wicked servant, so why didn't you do anything? And well, because nobody wanted to hear it, and nobody was buying it, and nobody was appreciating it. Everybody said I was on the wrong path. I was afraid I'd look stupid. You know, there's a million things you can say, but then he's going to say, well, what about all these thousands of people who were dying to hear what God could do through you? Mm. And see, that's, I'm not going to have to hear that because I'm taking this challenge to heart of being who I'm supposed to be. And it isn't just here while I'm here on this planet for a few people or a thousand people or how many people are buying my albums. It's for all those people who are listening to my music constantly in heaven, even as it's in me and not recorded because they hear it before it's out of my soul because it's coming from the magnificent artist centered in heaven. <laughs> Wow, that's incredible. It that's frees amazing. you, and it's daunting in the beginning when you first convert if you go there, but it's that's my freedom, is to know that. Yeah. And so that's really that's what amazing. continuum means for me, is that it's, you know, and there's just hundreds of examples of that validation with great musicians, and they're not great in their lifetime, they're great later, and I hope for only to be as great as I can be while I'm here. What happens after I'm gone is completely irrelevant to me. I'm moving to the next place. Right. Yeah, that's really amazing. Really beautiful. And yeah, you did. You totally, <laughs> you totally tied that up. <laughs> I can't <laughs> imagine a better way to, to do that. But moving to the practical, and can, we, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the process of actually, specifically as a composer, becoming a part of that continuum? You know, we have these early pieces on the album that, are perhaps the beginning or close to the beginning of your your process of grafting yourself onto that tree in a general way what kind of study goes into that especially for someone especially perhaps for someone who's beginning mm. as a composer mm. yeah well first of all you have to be open to everything you have to be open to lots of music you can't make a decision about what's good or bad because and again you know this is where i get in trouble because people decide they know what i'm thinking at that but so i'll have to be a little bit clear to try to avoid some of that but music with suggestive lyrics or bad lyrics foul language things that take you down into a darker thought process there's no reason for that you know i understand i get it i have come from the 
world without Christ and have joined him and converted and found the wisdom in his way. So I want to be clear, I'm not speaking from a, a throne or a holier-than-thou place, but the fact is, it's just not uplifting to listen to music like that with lyrics that send you, you know, into bad thoughts or dark thoughts or angry thoughts or sexual thoughts. It's just, it's pointless and silly. But there are lots of great pop songs, great songs from the pop world that are very clever. They're ironic in their writing. They have poetry involved. The way they craft these phrases together and tell a story in a three-minute song sometimes is really amazing. And so you have to sort through to find a maybe, but it's worth that to understand what's involved in this gift of music, because that's also what's involved in composing praise music, is to be able to do it well and not just rehash you know, the folk music from a per certain period or the rock music of a certain period. In order to really in have music that moves people, it can't always just be about you know, emotion or simple things that you know for a fact will sell in the genre you're in. My point is, if you're going to be a composer, then you also should know a little bit at least about songwriting. You have to know a little bit about improvisation. And the more you know about that in each of those things, the better off you'll be as a composer. And I think that it's just being open to everything and remembering that what we've lost, because that's where you learn this. For me, I think I've mentioned to you before that I study... When I study composers, I'm not just studying their music, but I read about their lives. I want to know who they were and why they did what they did. And you learn, like Bach was everything. Bach said, there's no reason to write anything except for the glory of God. So that's why he wrote everything. But he wrote for his students. He wrote for shows, concerts, for kings, for whoever he got hired for. But he also wrote songs for his family. And they would get together and have parties and dinners and drinks and in social and improvise and make up things and sing songs and all of this stuff that was whatever of the culture of their day. Not all of it was for serious concerts, serious things, sacred music or his students. Some of it was just flat out fun and recreation and enjoyment. And that's my mm -hmm. point. You have to know all of the things that people are moved by, because if you only know one way of writing, then you are selling yourself short and you're cheating the listeners because you have to challenge the listener with something that they haven't heard before and something that brings in things. It isn't that you're reinventing the wheel. It's that they, have, they literally haven't heard the sounds that I'm putting together because no one's ever done them before. And nobody's strung the music the, together the way I am because I'm a unique individual who's following my unique path. But that path has been built by my studying everybody who came before me and being open to everything that's come before me, including, you know, birds chirping in the woods and water running and all the rhythmic aspects that you come there, which Beethoven was influenced by and putting together music from that experience. So then I write my music and somebody hears it and there's one person says, this is really beautiful. And another says, oh yeah, but it's not like the pop music or it's not real jazz or it's not classical. So there you have a person who's you know, needing that music that fills their small little world view. And we're always going to have people like that, but the artist can never be ruled by that reality. They have to be an individual. So that's, if you're going to be a composer, basically you have to have a thick skin. I guess that's the answer. Listen to everything, mm -hmm. be influenced by everything. Don't decide that something's not good. Don't decide that some music is not relevant until you actually have studied it. And then you can make the statement, okay, this music does not serve a purpose in my path. But it might have a purpose in someone else's, so be careful about saying whether it's worthless or not. That's always a very dangerous place to go with your public comments. Mm, yeah, it's, it's not the answer I expected, but it 
it's such a basic necessity for study because otherwise, like you said, you are selling yourself short. Yeah. You know, it's it's not so much that you have a, a moral obligation to know this or that composer, but as an artist, you do. You need it. You need to be open and learn what's come before. It's not so that you can impress someone with your knowledge of the classics or something. Right. That's well said. I agree. You study because you want to know and you want to learn and you want to be good at what you do. And, you know, that's why, I mean, I'm not the only person saying this, but there are many people, you know, younger than myself, not only my own family, my young, my daughters who are much younger, of course, and then their peers, there's so many of them just disgusted with what's out there musically. And it isn't because it's all foul language or bad or whatever, or suggested. It's it's just not well written. And there are so many people who don't even know, you know, who some of the great pop songwriters were before them or have no use for that. So even in that limited sphere, they're not studying people who came before them. They're just jumping in and saying, I want to write a song because I can string chords together. So I'm going to be an artist. And that, yeah. that's, that's the world we live in. And that's a very big problem now is that everybody is equal to Beethoven. Now everybody is equal to Gershwin. Now, you know, mm. nobody has to pay dues and practice and work hard. These string players that are on this recording, these are absolutely incredible musicians. And it would be challenging for any string musician to play this music. And if more of them who are accomplished hear this, they would be excited by that alone because, you know, these musicians are playing in keys that are very difficult for string players. And if string players are listening, then they know what I'm talking about. All you have to do is listen to it and find what key some of these things are. If you listen to the music, it sounds wonderful. It sounds beautiful, light, and joyful. And it is in the places that are so difficult to play in. You would have to be a virtuoso to play this music. And yet it sounds simple, and peaceful, beautiful, effortless, but you would have to be profoundly accomplished to make it sound like that. And that is part of the art form I like, is I like to deliver music that sounds very light, very beautiful and joyful, but the difficulty is in what it takes to get it to that level to deliver it. Mm. And the level of musicianship required to deliver something that sounds simple and beautiful and melodic. That's really the essence of, and that would that's goes right hand in hand with my my spiritual life as well. Is the demand of self denial, and then everybody looks at you and thinks, "Man, he's so peaceful. He must have an easy life." And I think that's a great compliment because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's nice when people think that because it means it's working, and the Lord is radiating through. That means it's working, and that's what you want. That's what we hope. You know, it seems like we're in a time when pop music has lost its connection to you know what you might call you know i don't know if you would call it higher forms of music or more developed more sophisticated whatever in that you know the great pop writers or musicians of the past were writing pop music genuinely pop music but it was inspired by and influenced by jazz or classical music or folk music and to take yeah, a different but, example, but like, you know, the early, the great, the great American songbook writers, mm -hmm. you know, were definitely mm -hmm. knowledgeable about classical music. Some of them were in the classical music world. I mean, I've, Gershwin's an obvious example of that, but I'm trying to think of the guy's name who wrote Victor Young, who wrote Stella by Starlight and My Foolish Heart. He was, he came from Russia. His real name was Russian, something Russian, I think. And, you know, he was a conductor, a classical conductor. So that seems to have been lost. I mean, it's like, because you were making a point, you can't dismiss pop music, but it tends to need to be sort of connected and receiving freshness and life and sophistication, which may be hidden by the composer from the influence of these, what you would call more artistic forms <laughs> yeah, of music. I, I think I'd better qualify my statement because I just realized I think you can't discount pop music 
that occurs up until about 1982. <laughs> 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 I, I was I was thinking that actually when I was thinking of pop music. That, that, you know, after 82, maybe 83, we could push it to 86 for a couple of tunes, probably. And, you know, maybe something's happened since there. That's, but that, I mean, and actually, not much. Not much that's giving, so funny giving. after what you said that you had to go. <laughs> you have to qualify that because that, yeah, that there you're right. I mean, you're absolutely, that's what I was alluding to is that there's nothing going on now because they don't have the cultural memory. They're not interested in studying that. And they should be studying those who came before them just like if I wanted to be a great composer of string music, I need to be listening to string music, not keyboards with synth strings or a movie that's done with all programmed strings and they sound real. You know, you don't get good at writing strings by listening to film scores alone, but you should listen to film scores to have the influence of how it works with the imagery. Sure. But again, it's just that you've got to be influenced by everything. And yeah, I'm glad that you pointed that out and got me to make my distinction. Is I, I completely have very little to no use for the pop music. That and, and you want to know the truth? The music that I like from the pop world, my daughters have shown me what's good. And so I listen to theirs and I'm like, yep, you got it. That's really good. These people are very talented. This is a really good song. This is a really good writer. This was well-crafted. But they've been raised, you know, with all of that time continuum of music. So they're actually able to recognize right. when something comes on that's good or when a band comes along that's really making a genuinely musical offering and not just, you know, look at me, I need money and call me an artist. And that's, that's a sad situation, but that is what's out there. So, yeah, all the pop music that is good, and there is some out there, I get that education from my daughters who are yeah. very, very discerning and not That's at all awesome. in the junk. Yeah. They're my great teachers for what's happening now in that world. Right. And of course, everybody, you know, it's well known that the great classical composers certainly took influence from folk music of yeah. the day, but yeah. also popular music to an extent. I have this book that I got. It's called the Fitzwilliam Virginal book. And the virginal is like the harpsichord before there was the harpsichord. It's very much like a harpsichord. And this is a book. It's a collection of Elizabethan English keyboard music. And a lot of those are taking pop melodies of the day and doing like theme and variations mm -hmm. on them mm -hmm. on a very sophisticated level. So this goes way back. It goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to go back to the the spiritual sort of allegory of the butterfly and, and specifically what you said at the end of the, the liner notes, which the listeners will have heard me read earlier, where you talk about after the butterfly has achieved his, his transformation and how people look at him and see a beautiful butterfly and don't remember what he used to be. And you said, uh, I'll read it again, that becomes irrelevant to us. And so we are no longer inspired to face our own cocoons. Instead, we look upon those who are no longer bound by theirs as the chosen few. This is something that, you know, you talked about a lot in our last interview, too. In that one, we talked about making the process transparent to people so that they won't be intimidated by it. But this is on a spiritual level. Well, I guess I just would like to raise that so you can you can talk a little bit more about that concept at the end there. Well, it's funny. I guess the way to get into that, in the homily I heard today at Mass, the priest said, in his opinion, his view, he said there are two kinds of Catholics. There are those who would tell Jesus, stop suffering so much and come down from the cross. I need a breather, and you shouldn't have to work that hard. You're God. And then there are the others who would say, thank you for what you're doing, and I want to come up and join you on that cross. And he was making a very clear distinction between what happened with Peter in the reading where he said, Lord, you shouldn't go to Calvary, you shouldn't be crucified, and the Lord said, get behind me. You're thinking, Satan, you're thinking as humans do, not as God does. 
And so he was making that point that there are those who would like everything to be a little bit easier and there are those who want. And he said, you have to think, pray, and decide which category you're in. He didn't say anything about who's better or not. He just made the distinction. And I agree with him. I actually have seen that as my own experience. And so that is kind of the basis of the butterfly in that writing, because when I first converted, I was very young, and I realized I was, I was a lot younger than I am now, I should say. I wasn't necessarily very young. I was in my 30s. But I noticed that, you know, everybody looked at me like I was some young guy who came in with a family and a young child, and I'm this person who's had no suffering, no struggles. I don't really know about the real world. I'm friendly, happy. I'm always smiling. I never seem to be upset. And, you know, as time went on, you know, five years in of pushing 40, I'm still getting that from everybody. And people are talking to me like I'm, you know, well, you know, you haven't lived long enough to really know what's going on. And, you know, you, when you have some suffering, you start to understand more about life. By then, you know, I, I had had quite a lot of suffering and a lot of yeah. different unique challenges, which I don't need to go in here. But I chose to do all of this with the practice of Catholicism, which is a practice of, you know, self-denial and not complaining and making the act of the will to choose to follow the Lord in good and bad. And that means, you know, you accept everything by his grace and with his grace. And the observation was, I noticed that those who are truly walking the walk, and really trying to be with Jesus, end up being seen by many as people who are naive, you know, not really well-rounded, not a lot of true wisdom, that don't have common sense, they don't get it, they're stupid even. I mean, you can put a lot of labels there, but it, those people who are following, in a nutshell, they're Christians at this level of joy, they clearly don't have a clue, because if they really knew what suffering was, they really knew how hard it was out here for us normal people, then, you know, they wouldn't be like they are, and they wouldn't be so joyful, and they wouldn't be so quick to tell us that we should pray, or we should maybe consider following Jesus, you know, the way they are. In other words, you become a hypocrite by their label, even if you're actually working to not be a hypocrite. And that, that was my observation, was that the more I worked, the more I became peaceful and more in love with God, and the less I let my problems bother me, the more kind I was all the time, the more people looked at me like I was, you know, basically an idiot and didn't understand <laughs> anything about the world at all. And mm. I, I, you know, I haven't spent the time defending that because I just, it was an observation, but I was the last one to know, so I, even in my own view, I factored that in with that writing, because I remember distinctly, and I have to be honest, in before my conversion, I was a person with a very short temper, a very bad temper, and I think we can just leave it at that, but you can imagine what goes with that, mm. and a very angry, permanently angry person, and wow. that's, I think that's the way I can describe it, and patience, are you kidding? None, zero, and I remember after being, you know, in church and being converted and actually following, I always like to say I'm following Jesus, not just going to church, because there is a difference. But after following the Lord and really studying for a little while and trying to learn how he is and who he is, I had this confrontation with somebody. Actually, I had a conversation and not a confrontation, but this woman looked at me and I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to have to probably work a little on this, getting this point across over here or there. And she was like, oh, you're going to be fine. You're like the most peaceful person I've ever met in my life. It's just so relaxing to be around you. And this was an agnostic person, not a spiritual person. She said, you're just so, it's so calming to be next to you. And you handle everything so peacefully. And you have such patience. And I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she noticed that my jaw was open because this was, she was saying something to me that I did not recognize had yet occurred. 
And I went and sat down and thought about it, and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not who I used to be. This is really beautiful. And this is what comes from that you know, work with Jesus. He definitely will change us if we're interested in changing, but sometimes we're the last one to know that we've changed. And if we don't have that documentation, like an album, well, this woman was a documentation of that, then I was able to strive more for even greater patience because she was saying I was that, and I was thinking that I wasn't that. And so I had to bow to her view because she had no reason to, you know, say something to me other than what was true in that particular situation. She didn't gain anything by saying that. It was just something off the cuff remark. And I realized then that I wasn't paying attention to what Grace was doing in my life as well as I should. And I started to realize that maybe all of those people I had judged as clueless or stupid, they might not have been. They may have been higher up than I even realized, and they had the humility to just let people say that about them. And as Mm -hmm. that has been my experience, not to say I'm humble, because you know what happens when you say that, but still, we are supposed to be working on this, and we are just like I always tell people trying to become holy I'm trying to become a great pianist. If at some point I start doing great things on the instrument, I ought to be able to admit it. That's not bragging. That is humility. Saying the truth, not just the truth of that I need more practice, because that is true. But there's also a truth that I have achieved a degree of Mm. mastery. And that would be translate to I have become one with Christ in many areas of my life. It is him living and not me, as St. Paul says, and we all can have that. But unfortunately, we're all looking at these people who have that and are going around peacefully and prayerfully, and we're saying, well, if they had the problems I have, then they would know what's really going on and they wouldn't float around like that. And yeah, so I guess I've taken a long time answering that, but it was in Portugal recently where I was sitting with some people and they were talking and asking questions and some of them had discovered my past and found out what I was like before I converted and it was eye-opening because everyone was thinking gosh I just thought you had grown up had great family experience great education great this great that everything was smooth for you you're a cradle catholic you just never had any problems and it's just like clockwork for you and everything's lined up perfectly. I just thought, you know, and you're always at mass praying. I just figured you're just the textbook case of somebody who never gets scathed by anything. And then we all laughed because that is exactly the opposite of my story. Yeah, yeah. And you know that. So that's why I wrote that particular thing. And that was the catalyst of the music itself was early on just writing music that matched my personal conversion and trying to be objective about who I had become and who I was. And that answers your first question, why did I not play on the album? Because I wanted to be watching me as the butterfly and see the whole thing happening and try to be objective about where I need to go next to keep Mm. flying. Wow. Well, you just, you just, that was definitely the Holy Spirit, like perfect ending to the interview. (laughs) That would be the Holy Spirit then. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Mark, you know, I, I hope in these podcasts that I do these interviews, I hope to do things, at least some things that are of lasting value. And I, and I hope to bring people closer to God and, and when it's with you, I know that it has that value. So I'm so grateful to have you come on the podcast. I always love talking to you. So thank you very much. Yeah, I I love you, Tom. I'm so grateful to you for doing this, asking me to join you yet again, and the opportunity to share these things and share with your listeners. And I hope that many people benefit from it. And I'm the same way. I benefit from these as well. God bless you and God bless everybody listening. And you can also get the album free if you don't want to pay for it. Go get it and hear it because it's always about the listening. It's not about, you know, necessarily spending the money. You can download this on in streaming. You can go and get it one or two songs on any of the internet places. The hard copies are only available at my website. And of course, I'm partial to those because I'm old school. But, right. uh, you know, but don't just sit and 
miss out on it. It's even actually on YouTube on my channel, and I put the whole thing up there on a video so people could hear it and yeah. stream it up there. So go yeah. listen to it. And again, thank you, Tom, for having me. It's really great to be with you. Yeah, God bless you. And, and, by the and way, I will great work on the album. People should hear you play. It's all good. Oh, thank you, you they so much. They should hear you with these thank great you. string players. You were a complete equal to them and what they do. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, so I'll link to all that stuff on the show notes for today's episode. And thanks again. Thank you.